Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, uh, new webinar uh, series on androgen access in women, a, multi a multidisciplinary challenge. Uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, today our speaker is uh, Dr. John Stevenson from the United Kingdom uh, with the topic uh, androgen access and metabolic and cardiovascular disorders. Uh, before Dr. Stevenson to start with the, with the presentation, I would like uh, to remind uh, our attendees uh, that uh, you can leave uh, your questions uh, using the question function that you will find in your control panel. And at the end of this uh, webinar, uh, Dr. Stevenson uh, kindly will, will answer to your questions. So now, please, uh, Dr. Stevenson, when you want, uh, you can start with your presentation. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the effects of androgen excess uh, on metabolic and cardiovascular disorders. I'll just show my uh, disclosures. So when we're considering androgen excess, then some of the causes of androgen excess are shown on this slide. The main one is polycystic ovarian syndrome but also congenital adrenal hyperplasia and Cushing syndrome can be associated with androgen excess. And then there are certain adrenal and ovarian tumors, but by far the commonest cause of androgen excess in women is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I'm gonna start just by reminding you of the metabolic effects of testosterone uh, as it affects cardiovascular risk markers. So testosterone uh, has been shown to lower cholesterol, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol and triglycerides uh, depending on the circumstances. But it certainly lowers HDL cholesterol and it will usually reduce insulin sensitivity. In other words, testosterone tends to increase insulin resistance. It does have an effect on the hemostatic system where it can augment fibrinolysis and antithrombin activity, but it also can increase platelet aggregability. So some of these uh, effects would be wanted, some of these effects would certainly not be wanted. When we're looking at androgen excess, that can be different from just looking at the effects of testosterone itself. And what I want to concentrate on in this talk is to look at effects on glucose and insulin metabolism, the effects on uh, lipids and lipoproteins, the relationship of androgen excess to the metabolic syndrome, and finally finish off with looking at some of cardiovascular outcomes in patients with androgen excess. So let's start by looking at glucose and insulin metabolism. Insulin resistance is a very important metabolic risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, insulin resistance simply means the resistance of tissues to the effects of endogenous insulin. This is mainly the muscles, um, but they become less responsive to the effects of endogenous insulin. Now this can result therefore in impaired glucose tolerance, uh, in hyperinsulinemia because uh, if there is insulin resistance, the pancreas tries to overcome it by uh, producing excessive insulin. Uh, and in extreme cases, of course, it can develop into type 2 diabetes mellitus. So all patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus will be insulin resistant, but it should be remembered that you can be insulin resistant without actually having type 2 diabetes. And finally, there can be impaired suppression of lipolysis so that insulin resistance can interfere with body fat mobilization and deposition. And so we have the situation whereby if you become insulin resistant, this will tend to lead to an increase in weight in a central uh, or abdominal distribution. And central weight gain itself, however, will increase insulin resistance. So you can see that you can get into 
a sort of vicious circle or even a vicious spiral whereby your insulin resistance is making you increase weight centrally and that in turn is making the insulin resistance worse which makes the accumulation of central fat worse and so on. Now if we look at the effects of androgen excess in terms of insulin resistance then these are data from the United States showing that about 80% of patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome actually have insulin resistance. But if you look at those patients who are also obese, then 95% will have insulin resistance. And polycystic ovary syndrome has about a five-fold increased risk of type 2 diabetes uh, as was shown in a study with an eight-year follow-up. So clearly insulin resistance and indeed type 2 diabetes are common, very common in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome and this of course being the major uh, syndrome associated with androgen excess. This is a study looking at the effects of testosterone treatment in postmenopausal women and so these patients are undergoing uh, studies of insulin metabolism by using the euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp which gives you a, a good measure of insulin sensitivity which of course is the inverse of insulin resistance. And what this study showed was looking at the effects of giving estradiol valerate alone or testosterone and decanoate uh, alone or a combination of the two and you can see that for the estrogen alone there is no significant change in insulin sensitivity but giving the testosterone ester you'll see there is a significant decrease in insulin sensitivity and combining the two treatments again you see the decrease in insulin sensitivity. So if we move now on to lipids and lipoproteins then again in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome about 70 percent will have dyslipidemia. Now this will be due in part to the androgen excess but also in part to the increased uh, central fat distribution that these patients have. And what we find in these patients is that they actually have a raised total and LDL cholesterol, a low HDL cholesterol, raised triglycerides and an increase in the very small very dense LDL particles which of course are extremely atherogenic particles. So the picture here with androgen excess is a little different to that seen just with the effects of testosterone alone in normal women. Now this is a study looking at some premenopausal women uh, with, um, um, with uh, premenopausal symptoms uh, receiving testosterone implants. So it's looking at the effects of testosterone given by implant so it's, uh, on uh, lipids and lipoproteins. This study comes from uh, Helen Butler and her colleagues uh, in the UK. What she found was that there was a significant reduction in HDL cholesterol and in its carrier apolipoprotein A1 and in fact she was also looking at hemostatic parameters and you can see with these various hemostatic parameters there was actually no change in any of these. So the main change that was seen giving testosterone to otherwise healthy premenopausal women was a significant reduction in HDL cholesterol. And I want to look at the uh, relationship of androgen excess to the metabolic syndrome. And to start off just by reminding you that the metabolic syndrome is a collection of metabolic disturbances, each one of which in its own right can be a risk factor for coronary heart disease and indeed some of them are risk factors 
for the development of type 2 diabetes. So you can see the various factors involved here. We have uh, increases in blood pressure, dyslipidemia, central obesity, of which I've already been speaking, impaired glucose tolerance, and coagulation disturbances, and they all link together. But the pivotal disturbance in metabolic syndrome, although not 100% present, is insulin resistance. So this is what we mean by in the metabolic syndrome. So if we look at how we diagnose metabolic syndrome, uh, and these criteria are now uh, generally agreed upon by various uh, medical organizations, were published uh, by George Alberti uh, several years ago. So the presence of any three of the following abnormalities can give a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Firstly, an increased waist circumference, for those of us outside of the USA, and particularly in Europe, that would be for males uh, an increased waist circumference of greater than 94 centimeters, for females 80 centimeters. You'll see that our American colleagues actually have to have rather more generous uh, uh, criteria, and so for males 102 centimeters, and for females above 88 centimeters. The presence of a fasting glucose level above 5.6 millimoles per liter, or if the patient is taking any form of glucose lowering agent, that would also count as one criterion. An HDL cholesterol below 1.04 millimoles per liter for men and below 1.3 milli uh, millimoles per liter for women. Fasting triglycerides above 1.7 millimoles per liter. And in terms of blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure above 130 or a diastolic blood pressure above 85. So the presence of any three of these different criteria allows the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. And this is now generally accepted. So Let's have a look at the association of metabolic syndrome with androgen excess. What we find normally in normal adults, and these again are uh, data from the United States, but the prevalence there of metabolic syndrome is about 23%. But if you look at the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, you can see that it is almost doubled. It's 43%. So a major association of androgen excess with the metabolic syndrome. Now, if we then look at the effects of uh, androgen excess on blood pressure, then the problem here is that studies of polycystic ovarian syndrome women uh, and, and looking at blood pressure, the findings are often confounded by body mass index and by a, a high body mass index because of course that is a, also a major uh, risk factor for hypertension. So this is a cross-sectional study of over 150 women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and what they found in the, what the first study, this is the one in hypertension, was that the free androgen index was associated with an elevated uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, which was independent of age and obesity and insulin resistance and dyslipidemia. So this is a direct association with blood pressure. And another study looking at 36 women with PCOS uh, compared with 55 controls who were matched to these PCOS women according to body mass index. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring was performed and the main finding of this study was that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have higher daytime systolic blood pressures. So this would seem to be the result of androgen excess in this case. And lastly, let's look at cardiovascular outcomes in patients with androgen excess. So why are we concerned about uh, androgens and particularly testosterone and the cardiovascular system? 
and it is because there's a widespread belief that in terms of coronary heart disease at least, testosterone is harmful. Why, why is this a common thought? Because coronary heart disease is more common in males than in females, and of course males have got much greater testosterone levels. Premenopausal females with coronary heart disease have been found to have higher testosterone levels than controls. Anabolic steroid abusers get premature coronary heart disease. And finally, testosterone does have some adverse metabolic effects. So this is why people can complete conclude that testosterone is harmful. However, Testosterone could be considered to be beneficial in terms of coronary heart disease risk. Men with coronary heart disease have lower testosterone levels than age-matched men without coronary heart disease. Hypogonadal males have got an increased risk of coronary heart disease. High postmenopausal endogenous androgen levels are associated with a lower coronary heart disease risk and we know that testosterone does have some direct beneficial vascular effects. These effects seem to be um, independent of effects on the vascular endothelium. So what are the vascular effects of testosterone? Well, testosterone causes arterial relaxation in vitro, uh, looking at studies on uh, uh, rings of arteries that are, that are exposed to testosterone uh, where the relaxation can be measured. It appears to be an endothelium independent effect because in these studies if the endothelium is reduced from the vessels you still see relaxation. And Studies have shown that this is not mediated through prostaglandin I2, it's not mediated through cyclic GMP, but it may be mediated through potassium dependent channels. And the interesting thing here is that testosterone itself is more potent in causing arterial relaxation than any of the testosterone analogues or esters. And when you're considering women uh, who perhaps are treated with testosterone, then this is an important consideration to bear in mind. So what does endogenous testosterone uh, do in terms of vascular function uh, in postmenopausal women? And these are healthy postmenopausal women. So here is a study of 60 women aged between 45 and 75, and they are assessing vascular function by looking at flow-mediated dilatation in the brachial artery as measured by ultrasound. And the findings were that in terms of the testosterone levels in these women, those with the lowest uh, testosterone levels in the lowest tertile had the lowest flow-mediated dilatation response. Those with medium, the medium tertile had a better response, but a significantly, a significantly higher response compared to the ones with the lower uh, testosterone levels was seen in those with the higher testosterone levels, and these are the actual levels being shown here. We also know that uh, giving testosterone uh, implants to uh, women, postmenopausal women, and these are the data from Sue Davis's unit in Australia. Here you've got women who are on uh, estrogen uh, and uh, implants, and are then given uh, testosterone together with the estrogen. So there's the control group showing in terms of flow mediated dilatation uh, no improvement but here is the estrogen plus testosterone, the addition of testosterone to the estrogen giving a significant increase in flow mediated dilatation. So we can look at the, the effects of testosterone, at least, in terms of vascular function. But I now want to look at the effects on atheroma or atherosclerosis. And looking at subclinical atherosclerosis, then it has been shown 
that you can see increased carotid artery intimum media thickness in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Women, these women have a greater prevalence of coronary artery calcification. So this is an overall view of the various published studies that was uh, published uh, in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolic Medicine. However, it is clearly not straightforward because individual studies have given very varying effects. So here at the top you see a study that found that endogenous androgens were negatively correlated to carotid artery intermediate thickness. But in this study, the endogenous androgens were positively correlated to carotid artery intermediate thickness. And, and yet a third study showed no relation between endogenous androgen levels and coronary heart disease death in women. So clearly we've got quite a confused picture here, although in general it would seem that there probably is a relationship between certainly uh, androgen excess and subclinical atheroma. So here is a study of nearly 2,000 postmenopausal women aged between 45 and 84 where they were measuring carotid artery into immediate thickness and also uh, coronary calcium scores by computed tomography. And what this study, this large study found was that both total and free testosterone levels were positively associated with coronary artery intermediate thickness. There was no association seen between either estradiol or testosterone and coronary calcium scores, but in women who actually had coronary calcium present in their arteries, then those with low free testosterone had a greater coronary calcium score than those with higher testosterone levels. And finally, let's look at cardiovascular events and women with androgen excess. So again, these are studies with women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And here we have a 20-year retrospective cohort study of 2,300 women with a mean age of 30 years. And this study showed that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have a greater incidence of myocardial infarction and angina, but not of stroke. In contrast, a 31-year retrospective cohort study, but of only 319 women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and much older women, a mean age 57, this study found that the polycystic ovarian syndrome women had a greater incidence of stroke, but not of myocardial infarction. So we seem to have, again, conflicting uh, outcomes here, although clearly there are major differences in terms of the mean age of the study groups. This is a big study of uh, nearly 6,500 perimenopausal women aged 50 to 59, looking at the association of testosterone and cardiovascular events. 49 women in the study had sustained a myocardial infarction, 49 had sustained a stroke, and six women had both a myocardial infarction and a stroke. And these were compared with matched women who had no cardiovascular disease, and what they found was that the women who had cardiovascular disease had a significantly lower androstenedione level and a significantly lower testosterone level. So this would again suggest that there is actually an association between low androgen levels and an increased risk of cardiovascular events. So let me conclude then of the findings, the main findings of the effects of androgen excess in women. In terms of lipids and lipoproteins, then we see clearly reduced HDL cholesterol, an increase in triglycerides, an increase in LDL cholesterol, but particularly in those small, dense LDL particles. In terms of glucose and insulin metabolism, there is increased insulin resistance, 
impaired glucose tolerance and an increased risk for type 2 diabetes mellitus. In terms of metabolic syndrome and the association in, of androgen excess in women, there is a clearly increased incidence. There is an increased incidence of uh, abdominal fat in women with androgen excess, uh, and that's a major feature of metabolic syndrome. And there's also this association between the androgen excess and increased blood pressure. And finally, in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, I would summarize that probably there is an increase in subclinical atheroma with androgen excess, but the association with cardiovascular events is certainly not established. So I conclude the physiolog physiological levels of androgens are quite possibly beneficial for the cardiovascular system. So changes in uh, levels of androgens within the physiological range, the in an increase is probably somewhat beneficial. However, androgen excess clearly has adverse effects for the cardiovascular system, and at the same time, androgen deficiency has adverse effects for the cardiovascular system. So androgens and even testosterone I think on the whole tend to be beneficial for the cardiovascular system providing you don't have too much and providing you don't have too little. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Stevenson for your presentation. It was uh, really great. And uh, we continue with the next activity on this uh, webinar on androgen excess uh, with uh, our polls. And, uh, uh, everyone can participate, so a question will appear on your screen and you have a few options. Uh, you can select uh, only one and after each question uh, we will tell the, the correct answer. So here is uh, the first uh, question today. Here are the results from our first question today. Will women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have 38% of our attendees answer the option A, 46% of our attendees answer the option B, 8% of our attendees answer the option C, and also 8% of our attendees answer the option D. In this case, the correct answer, it was the option B, reduced HDL cholesterol. So we continue with the, the next uh, question today. Here are the results from our second question today. Women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have 50% of our attendees answer the option A. There were no answers for the option B. 42% of our attendees answer the option C. 
and 8% of our attendees answer the option D. In this case, uh, the correct answer it was the option C, increased central fat distribution. And we continue with the, our last question today. Here are the results from our last question today. High androgen levels are associated with, no, there were no answers for the option A, 31% of our attendees answered option B, 23% of our attendees answered, answered the option C, and 46% of our attendees answered the option D, that in this case, it was the correct one, a lower CHD risk in postmenopausal women. So thank you everyone for, for participate. And uh, uh, we'll give uh, you one more minute uh, if you have uh, some extra questions for uh, Dr. Stevenson. And uh, I would like to ask him if he has uh, some uh, comment uh, regarding the, the answers uh, from uh, our attendees. I would say that uh, the only thing I can conclude is that I seem to have uh, confused them fairly successfully since they seem to be fairly evenly split between get getting the right answer and getting the wrong answer. So uh, <laughs> I can't comment further on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And uh, here we have uh, uh, the first question today. So everyone will be able to read uh, through the chat. And uh, it's coming uh, through, uh, from uh, Jano Santa. And uh, is there any data or wherever that is, is the absolute levels of testosterone in the more important indicator for these mentioned conditions or the estradiol testosterone ratio, especially in case of uh, CBD? There's really very conflicting evidence. Um, there are some studies that have would suggest that uh, estradiol levels are more important. Some studies would suggest that uh, they're not important and that it is androgen levels. So I don't think I can give you a, a conclusive answer on that at all. Um, I don't think that the measuring the levels is particularly helpful anyhow. Uh, so it's really a bit of a hypothetical question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for your answer. It uh, looks like that uh, we don't have uh, any more questions for your attendees, so we we'll, would we'll like uh, to thank you for, for your presentation, for your time, and for being together uh, with us. I hope that uh, all the attendees enjoyed uh, your, your great uh, presentation. And uh, also, I will take the opportunity to invite uh, our attendees for our next session in uh, Androgen Access that will take place on the uh, 29th of June. Uh, with, uh, with our speaker, Professor Irene Lambrinudaki, President of the European Menopause and Andropause Society. So, so also I would like to remind uh, our attendees that this uh, session is being recorded. So in the following days, uh, you will receive uh, the instructions uh, how to view uh, again uh, online. Mm -hmm. So once again, Professor, we, we really appreciate uh, to, to have uh, to have you today. Thank you very much, you. and uh, and wishing you a very good day to you, and uh, and to all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you.